to see each of you here. What a blessing it is to come together at the parish church of Christ to worship our God this morning and to study His Word together. For those of you who may be a little bit more observant, I may have noticed that the Sunday morning lessons uh, for the last several weeks have come from the book of Mark. And we continue with that theme this morning uh, as we look at the ministry of Jesus as it's recorded in Mark chapter 1. Now, the book of Mark is one of my favorites. And it's hard for me to pick any favorite in the Bible, but I do love the book of Mark because it is an action-filled version of the gospel. Mark has more records of demon possessions than any other gospel. And he has far less, far shorter uh, overall sections of teaching, but he talks quite a bit about how much Jesus does teach. So what Mark likes to do is to take a narrative form that he learned from the Old Testament and apply it to the life of Jesus in such a way that he gives us details about Jesus' life in a very quick, uh, rapid-fire succession. And we get this very fast-paced image of Jesus' ministry. But what that does for us uh, is it provides for a great reading material. If you want to see what Jesus said, you've got to go to Matthew and Luke. But if you want to see what Jesus did, go to Mark. Because he likes to tell us those things. So as we open up this morning to Mark chapter 1, to the beginning of Mark's gospel, we consider the ministry of Jesus. And who better to tell us about Jesus' ministry than the evangelist who wrote what Jesus did more than what Jesus said. Now as we study this morning, I'd like for us to notice four things about the ministry of Jesus. Breaking a pattern here. Four things, not three. But they all start with the letter A. Jesus' ministry, according to Mark chapter 1, was anticipated. It was anticipated. It was approved. It was authoritative. And it had an aim. It was anticipated. It was approved. It was authoritative. And it had an aim. And we're going to dig into each one of these different points this morning as we study from Mark chapter 1. First, we consider that Jesus' ministry was anticipated. As those of us who live on the other side of the cross, living after the sacrifice of Christ, it might be a little bit hard for us to imagine what it was like to live in anticipation of the coming Messiah. But as we read from the Old Testament and we see the prophecies that are made, Mark refers to two of them, one from Malachi and one from Isaiah, we see that the people of God were very much in anticipation of a Savior, a Deliverer. Uh, so much so that they were constantly citing these quotations, hoping that the Savior had come. And so when Mark opens up, he begins his gospel by explaining and quoting from those citations. We read in Mark 1, verse 2, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, The whole lesson, my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And here Mark quotes these, uh, these prophecies in reference to John the Baptist, who comes to prepare the way for the Lord. He is the, he is the cousin of Jesus, and he came to prepare the way. And so Paul says in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son to redeem those born of the law. The anticipated Lord had come. In fact, we know that from the very beginning, that God had a plan for mankind. From the moment that man sinned, God was prepared to redeem him. So we read the prophecy in Genesis 3.15 that says that the Lord will bruise the head of Satan and that he will bruise his heel. And so over the course of time, mankind has been waiting for God to come in the flesh. And Jesus finally comes. So this is the message that we read in Mark 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the Son of God. And so John appears in verse 4, baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He's preparing the way. Jesus' ministry is anticipated. Some have said that Jesus' death on the cross was an afterthought. Some have said that his original plan was to come and to establish a physical kingdom here on earth. But we know as we study the scripture, as we see these citations that Mark gives, that we find in other prophecies as well, that Jesus' plan was always 
to die for us. As so we notice in Mark 1 says, what John says, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strapless of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. John declares that indeed Jesus is the one who has been proclaimed throughout the Old Testament, and that he will be greater than any other prophet to the degree that the other prophets are not even worthy to stoop down and touch his feet. <coughs> Truly, this Jesus is the Son of God. He was anticipated when he appeared. It was not haphazard. It was planned by God. So we first see that the, the ministry of Jesus was anticipated. But we also see in Mark chapter 1 that Jesus' ministry was approved by God. If you and I were living at the time that Jesus began his ministry, and we were Jews anticipating the Christ, we might be wondering to ourselves, how will we know if he comes? How will we recognize the Messiah? We've heard the prophecies, we've studied them, we know what he's supposed to do for us, but how will we know when he's really coming? And in fact, if we look at the history record, we see that there were a number who claimed to be the prophesied Messiah. And so how do we know that Jesus really is the Son of God? Well, we know because his ministry was approved by God. So even before Jesus says anything in Mark, God speaks and declares that he is his Son. In Mark 1, 9 through 11, we read the account of Jesus' baptism. He comes to John, who is baptizing. And he was baptized by him in the Jordan, verse 10, Mark 1. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. And the Spirit is sitting on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Before Jesus ever says a word in the book of Mark, God says, this is my Son. Jesus' ministry is approved from the beginning. He didn't have to declare himself because God declared him in a public way. So now that those who are wondering, how will we recognize the Christ? It's been made clear. He has been declared before man. Today, when we are concerned about some doctrinal truth, when we say, how can we know what is true? We also have God's great declaration. We go to His Word, the Scripture, to find that truth. Jesus' ministry would have been worthless had it not been approved by God. Similarly today, we cannot serve God. We cannot truly be His servants unless He approves of us. Otherwise, we're serving ourselves or something else. We follow God's simple plan in Scripture, and the Spirit will bear witness to our approval. We read in Romans 8, verse 16, that the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. When we have followed God's simple plan, we too can be approved. And we also study God's Word and use it appropriately to know that we are approved. And that great scripture so often quoted, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. What does Paul say about being approved before God? Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handled. The word of truth. When we use God's word appropriately, we too can be approved. Jesus' ministry was anticipated according to Mark 1. Jesus' ministry was also approved according to Mark 1. But we also see that Jesus' ministry was authoritative. We're going to camp out here for a little while. Let's, let's look at Mark 1, 21 through 28 and read there together. And they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue, and he was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. 
And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. As I said in the introduction, it's in the book of Mark that we see the most demon possessions. And of course, Jesus calling these demons out of people. And this is done primarily to show the authority that Jesus has. Jesus' ministry being one with authority makes it unique. No prophet of God prior to Jesus claimed the authority that he had. So when we read the prophecies in the Old Testament, we see phrases like, this is the word of the Lord. But Jesus places himself on an equal plane with God. He does this here. As he calls out the demon, he does it in other places. In Mark 2, 9, we read, Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? Verse 10. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Over and over again, Jesus demonstrates his authority, not only over the demons, but also over nature. We read in Mark 4, verse 41, following Jesus' stilling of the storm, they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus' ministry is characterized by authority. Only the Son of God could have an authority like this. This is what Nicodemus excuse me, recognizes in John 3 and verse 2. He says to Jesus, We know that you're a teacher from God, because a man can only do these things if God is with him. Jesus demonstrates over and over again that he has the authority to minister in the way that he does. Today, it's just as important for us to emphasize the authority of Jesus as it was some 2,000 years ago. Jesus' ministry was anticipated. It was approved and it was authorized. It was authoritative. And finally, we see that Jesus' ministry had an aim. Jesus' ministry was well aimed. Jesus' ministry could have been... It could have been all of the things we said, anticipated, approved, authoritative, but it needed to be aimed in order to have a proper end to it. As was suggested earlier, God planned the ministry of Jesus from the very beginning, from the first time of man's sin. And Jesus' ministry was climaxed in his death on the cross for the sins of every man who has and ever will live. We see in the book of Mark, the way that he depicts Jesus' ministry, that he is well aware of his purpose from its outset. Brother, uh, Brother Billy Porter read this morning what we see in Mark 1. Jesus says to Peter, let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Jesus recognized that he began his ministry to declare the good news of the kingdom. We read in Mark 1, 14 through 17 this. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God. He said, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Verse 15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. The purpose of Jesus' ministry was to prepare mankind for the coming of the kingdom. Verse 17, I will make you become fishers of men. The purpose of Jesus' ministry was to seek and save the lost. And this included the raising up of his apostles. And then we go over to verses 35 through 39, from which we already read and we saw in verse 38 that Jesus' ministry himself was purposed for preaching his kingdom. We repeatedly see this early in the book of Mark. Jesus' ministry had a purpose, a very clear purpose. He had an aim in going out. He didn't randomly decide to do this. 
and figure out his details along the way, like so many of us do in our projects. Now we know that all of this is rooted in God's love for us. We read in 1 John 4 9, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. Jesus' ministry was anticipated. It was approved. It was authoritative. And it had an aim. Now there's an application in this for us today. Because each and every one of us have an opportunity to participate in Jesus' ministry. And in a way, our ministry as well has been anticipated. For God provided long ago an opportunity for us to be a part of his kingdom. He purchased our entrance fee with his blood. And he allows us to be a part of that great kingdom. Our ministry is anticipated so much so that in places, Paul even calls it a predestined thing. And that word can be misunderstood, but it's true that God had it in his mind for us to be a part of the ministry of Jesus. We also saw earlier that our ministry can be approved when we obey God. Jesus paid the price for us. If we know that he is the Son of God, we've heard the gospel message. We believe that message. We change our mind and heart. We confess our sin and our Savior. We're baptized. Then we too can be approved by God. We continue to walk in the light, John tells us. We can have an approved ministry as part of the kingdom. But we can also know that our authority is in God. We trust in the Savior whose ministry was authoritative. We lean on His authority, not our own. So much so that Peter and John in front of the council in Acts 4 say, should we listen to you or to God? You judge, and we cannot. But speak the things we have seen and heard. And we can have a purpose. So many people walk around in this life not knowing where they're going or what they're doing. They have questions about where they came from, what their purpose is. And God gives us a purpose in Jesus Christ to share His love with the world. He commissions us to share His message with all nations. Just as Jesus had a name, we too have a name through Him to evangelize the world. So the question comes to each and every one of us this morning. Are we part of that kingdom? Is our eternal well place anticipated? Are we approved by God so that we can live with Him one day on high? Do we trust in the proper authority? Does our life have an aim or are we foundering on seas of doubt and uncertainty? An invitation is about to be offered so that you can find a life that mimics the life of Christ, one that is approved, one that trusts in the authority of God, one that has an aim, one that was anticipated long ago when Jesus paid the price for you. This invitation is always open, but we like to sing a song to make it known to our guests, and as well for those of you who are already Christians. We feel like you may have fallen off the boat this morning, or you just need to come. The invitation is open as well. We ask you to come now as we stand as we stand.